Hello again, guys. Um, we're going to go ahead and continue on with our nervous system chapter. Um, we're getting towards the end here, so if you haven't started looking over some stuff, um, I would recommend studying some of the Quizlet sets and looking over those um, just to really refresh your memory from before spring break as well. Okay, so we left off talking about the protective layers of the human brain and the central nervous system. Um, we're going to go ahead and pick up with different types of brain phenomenon, um, injuries, and diseases as well. At least a couple of like the bigger ones. Um, we'll see a couple other types kind of in the next couple days. Um, but we're going to go ahead and get started here. So one structure that we haven't yet touched on is called the blood brain barrier okay. kind of hard to say um, but your blood brain barrier okay is going to be all of the blood vessels that are around your brain and these are the least permeable capillaries of the body um, so least permeable means that they are the capillaries or those blood vessels that let hardly anything through. Um, so it's almost a type of chemical protection for our brain because with that inability for chemicals to pass through these capillaries, um, it actually helps to protect the brain from any type of wastes or toxins that might be found in the human body. Um, so once again, uh, capillaries are really teeny tiny blood vessels, okay? And the capillaries, when we get into our next system, which is cardiovascular system, we'll talk more about them but your capillaries are going to be where a lot of stuff can like diffuse back and forth typically. So like oxygen and carbon dioxide, like those are things that can pass through a lot of the capillaries. But when we get into the blood brain barrier, we find the capillaries there are not nearly as permeable as the, those compared to the rest of the body. So what your blood brain barrier does is it excludes a lot of potentially harmful substances. We've talked about the fragility of the human brain and that goes both physically and chemically as well. So a lot of times, okay, whenever we are taking different types of like medications and things like that, um, we're actually doctors and the FDA and people who've done medical research will research what type of medications can go through the blood brain, the blood brain barrier. Oof, that is hard to say. Okay, so for example, like if you have a headache and you go and take an Advil, okay, that Advil is not going to go up into your brain and make your brain numb. Instead, it's actually going to go to the areas that are in pain at that time. So um, it excludes a lot of things, especially when we think of like the amount of like urea and other wastes, like nitrogenous wastes, it prevents those wastes from getting to our very important brain. Now, the blood-brain barrier, even though it does a really good job with your typical day-to-day -day stuff, it is useless against some substances. Um, so fats and fat-soluble molecules can actually go through this barrier. And your brain actually naturally produces fats, which is kind of weird to think about. Um, but you have enzymes in your brain that actually break these down, so they typically don't cause a problem. Um, other things that can get through there, so like respiratory gases and anesthesia, we'll count that as well. Um, respiratory gases and anesthesia, so like if you go to the dentist and they put that mask on you and they put that um, the gas through that makes you kind of silly, kind of loopy, okay, those types of gases do affect your nervous system, okay, mainly it affects the brain and it is something that will basically numb those neurons um, so that you, it's blocking things like the pain receptors, it also helps to deal with like hormone balances, it kind of helps to calm you down. Um, same with anesthesia, so even anesthesia which you would normally get through like an IV or a needle, um, that would also be able to pass through and t continue into the brain, but we use it to benefit us whenever we're doing like surgeries or anything else like that. Okay. Now other things that can pass through this blood-brain barrier, um, things like alcohol and nicotine and other drugs um, that are not your typical pharmaceuticals. So like alcohol is a depressant, so it can actually slow down your brain's ability to communicate to different parts of it, which is why people tend to have a, um, 
like if somebody were to get drunk, um, they would have like slurred speech. And then they would also have um, like a delayed reflex time, okay? Because your brain is not moving at the pace that it normally does. It's not able to pass those messages as quickly as it normally can, okay? Nicotine, on the other hand, and there's a whole list of other drugs that have similar effects, um, but nicotine, probably the most common one, um, is one that actually speeds up the brain's ability to communicate, which you would think would be like, oh, it's moving faster, that means I would be better at things. But it gets to the point where sometimes the neurons will be firing so fast that they begin to miscommunicate, okay? Um, and so it can lead to a lot of, like, muscle twitches and um, a bunch of different, like, long-term effects. Um, especially when it comes into like the replay of like cell division and we get down to that molecular level that's where we see most of the effects are there um, if you have questions on any of these because i know this stuff is kind of interesting um feel free to email me don't put a private comment on google classroom because sometimes don't, those don't show up for like three days and then I feel bad because I feel like I ignored you, but I just didn't get the notification. All right, so um, with that, so blood-brain barrier, super important when it comes to protecting our brains chemically because it works against a lot of things, keeping the wastes and other toxins away from it. Uh, it is useless, though, against some substances. All right. Getting into some of the brain injury stuff. So there's three... Uh, major categories of traumatic brain injuries. Um, sometimes these will be abbreviated in, as TBIs. Okay, so a traumatic brain injury, um, one that is fairly common, mainly because nowadays we have better ways of diagnosing it than we used to, um, but one of the traumatic brain injuries that you see often are concussions. So concussions are defined and probably a good portion you have of you have had a concussion, whether it be from sports or doing dumb things. I don't know. All right. Um, but with concussions, these are slight brain injuries um, that typically lead to no permanent brain damage. Okay. So what a concussion is, is we know that the brain fits right in there in the skull itself and it fits pretty tight. However, when there is an impact on the brain that has so much force behind it, it can actually cause the brain to shift and smack into, okay, or push into um, the inside of the skull, and that would leave a slight damage spot to the brain, okay? And symptoms of concussions, a lot of times there's like nausea associated with it, there's typically some short-term memory loss right after the incident, um, but over time, especially like in your teenage years, your brain is able to recoup fairly well from that. I mean, sometimes it takes a couple days or even a couple weeks. Um, more serious ones can take up to a month or even a year to get back to full functioning. But it's to the point where you're able to function pretty well even a couple days later. Okay, he might have a headache, but typically there's no permanent brain damage because of them. Okay. The next step up would be a contusion. Okay, so a lot of times when I say the word contusion, people have heard it in, like, the context of, like, being the same as a bruise. Um, and that is not quite the same thing as what is happening on the brain. So with a contusion, there's actual nervous tissue destruction that happens. Um, typically, these are a lot more severe, and they'll have major symptoms, because once nervous tissue gets destroyed, there is no bringing it back. Um, your neurons are one of the few cells in the human body that very rarely divide. So basically, once your brain is done developing, um, right at your mm, preteen years is usually the very end of brain development. Not saying that you can't learn stuff after that, but the amount of neurons that you have will no longer like increase. Okay, your brain has grown to its at least most of its um, adult size at that point. And so what we see is that when nervous tissue gets destroyed, it cannot come back. Um, this can lead into a lot of other like major symptoms, such as like if people have a contusion near their bronchus area, um, that could potentially mean that they lose the ability to speak, or the frontal cortex, maybe they lose the ability to understand language. Um, if it's on the upper side of the frontal cortex, 
They could have like mood swings or their whole personality could change. So what we see is that contusions are a lot more serious than your typical concussion. Okay. And then the most serious of traumatic brain injuries are cerebral endemas. Okay, so cerebral endemas, typically we find these in the cerebral hemisphere. So we're talking about like the cerebrum, the bigger parts of the brain. And this is where, okay, when the brain gets injured to a point that it begins to swell. And sometimes it can be because of like a physical impact. There have also been some cases that I've read about where people have had like, um, I lost my train of thought, major chemical imbalances that have led to cerebral endemas too, okay? Like things like drug overdoses. Um, I've read a couple cases that have led into this swelling of the brain. So what happens is your brain fits fairly tight within the skull. And we know after you've like hit into your teenage years, your skull's completely fused at that point, okay? And so your skull cannot expand. However, the brain inside is swelling. So what happens is as that brain swells, it reaches the perimeters of the skull, and then it gets to the point where it can no longer expand anymore. At that point, the brain tissue will actually start to die off over the entirety of the brain. Um, a lot of times, people who have cerebral endemas, they will go get surgery to get part of their skull cut out to reduce that swelling. Sometimes they put the part of the skull back in, sometimes they don't which means they kind of have a soft spot like a baby again. Kind of weird. Fun facts. Okay. All right. And the next one we're going to talk about, this might be our last one, I'm running out of time because I'm talking too much apparently, is our cerebrovascular accident, or CVAs as they're known in the medical field, um, but your common person calls them a stroke. Okay, fairly common brain injury, one that you've probably all heard of before. Um, so what a stroke is, a stroke is where you have a bleeding part to the brain due to a ruptured blood vessel. Okay. And we know blood vessels are important for supplying like nutrients and oxygen and taking away wastes. And so when that blood vessel ruptures, there's going to be bleeding on the brain. Um, what happens is as that blood is no longer getting circulated properly, we'll see that there's pooling of blood there, and then we also see that the tissue that was getting that oxygen is no longer going to be able to function because they don't have that supply of oxygen anymore. And so with stroke victims, a lot of times they will ask that stroke victim because, let me rephrase this, I'm going on the wrong train of thought. Um, a lot of times if someone is suspected of having a stroke, they'll be asked to smile. And one of the reasons why they do this is because your facial muscles are usually the first muscles that are affected by the stroke. And one of the first symptoms of strokes is like facial paralysis. So when they smile, half of their face will look normal, like a smiling face. The other half will not move, looking like a frowny face. Um, that is one of the first symptoms of people having stroke. After that, the symptoms usually tend to get more significant, like memory loss, or they might um, pass out. Okay, At that point, anytime you suspect someone is having a stroke, it is best to take them to the hospital and get it checked out because most strokes you have to go into the brain and actually repair that blood vessel. So they actually get a brain surgery typically um, because if it goes on for too long, what happens is that that person can easily lose some of their like primary functions because that brain is, parts of the brain are dying off from lack of oxygen or even death, depending on how bad the stroke is and what vessel ruptured in the brain. Okay. All right, um, I'm almost out of time. We'll go ahead and pick up on the rest of this at a later date. Um, we'll probably talk, yeah, we'll talk about Alzheimer's real quick tomorrow, and then I've got an article for you, so I'll probably change up my calendar a little bit. If you guys have any questions on this, let me uh, send me an email. I will talk to you later. I hope you're doing great.